Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for uh, you giving us evidence that you are here, Father. Lord, we thank you that you said wherever two or three are gathered, you are here in the midst. And so, Lord, we want to acknowledge you because you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be glorified. You are worthy to be, uh, uh, to break us, Lord, and to spill us out as you did for us. Lord, I pray that as we study your word, that you would awaken our hearts and our minds, that, Lord, we would see Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, my name is uh, London Lee, and our topic today is the power of forgiveness. Now, if you, uh, before we start, I want you guys to do me a favor. Are you ready? I want you to smile. We're, we're in the house of the Lord, amen? We're worshiping the creator God who's sovereign. We should not have a morose, sad countenance. The Bible says we're not to carry any burdens on the Sabbath, amen? And so I want you to worship with me. This is not a monologue. This is a dialogue between God and us, amen? And so uh, my name is uh, London Lee, and our ministry, my wife and children would stand up. Uh, my wife uh, of almost 20 years, Nikisha, and our daughter, Selah, and our son in the back. We are a family in ministry, and uh, our passion is training ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Amen? Do you know that you're an ambassador? Did you know that you have a ministry, the Ministry of Reconciliation? And so for the last uh, 20 plus years, my wife and I have been traveling the world and with our children. Uh, but the last five years, we've been traveling state by state, town by town, little hamlet by little hamlet. And we've passed out over 200,000 tracks, over uh, 20,000 great controversies and steps to Christ. and so many different divine appointments, and we are back for our third time here in Houston. And did you know that not only are there Muslims here, but there are Buddhists here, and there are Catholics here, and there are Presbyterians here, and, and there are non-denominational people here. Did you know that? And they're waiting for you to be an ambassador. And so if you would like to know more, uh, you can go to ten-talents. Take out your phones, take a picture of uh, our website, and you can sign up for our monthly newsletter where we send out and let you know where we're at, what we're doing, and how the Lord is blessing. If you would like to partner uh, in supporting what the Lord does through us, that would be great. But even not, if you would just keep us in prayer. And so also, I have in my possession, uh, how many of you like studying the Bible? Amen. Everybody should go. How many of you guys like studying the Bible? Amen. So every Friday night, if you go to London Leonard Lee on YouTube, I have a series that we're doing on the Book of Romans and Righteousness by Faith. It's called Journey of Faith. And so you can just type in London Leonard Lee and that will come up. Now, how many of you all know what this is? All right, young people, anybody, I need a young person. Can somebody young, under 12, tell me, what is this? It's a cassette. So there's a ministry from back in the day called American Cassette Ministry. How many of you guys remember that? And uh, American Cassette Ministry now has taken over 45 years of material, and they have put it on an app. So all that old uh, 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 C.D. Brooks and Joe Cruz and Ron Halverson and HMS Richard Sr. and all those oldies are now available 100% free. Now, we don't want you just to listen. We want you to listen. We want you to learn. But more importantly, we want you to what? Share. Do you know that most people will download an app before they read a track? 
And so we brought a stack, a box of these, and we want to make them available to you to be able to pass out to your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors. And I tell people, hey, you guys remember Billy Graham? They're like, yes, I love Billy Graham. Well, guess what? That old time truth is here on this app. And it's the American Christian Ministries. How many of y'all want to share one of these cards? Well, I'm going to make them available in the foyer. So now that that is out of the way, we are talking about the power of forgiveness. Now, one of the things in our ministry, we have a school, and it's called the Master School of Evangeliving. Everybody say evangeliving. So what's the difference between evangelism and evangeliving? Action. All right, so evangelism, you usually bring in a pastor, an evangelist, a team of individuals. They come in and they work the area and you're praying and hoping that you'll get baptisms and the series goes and everybody else goes and then you guys are stuck like, now what do we do? But evangeliving is living a life that glorifies God. And so this study that we're going to have this morning came as a result of our family evangeliving. It's, it's more of an illustration, okay? So we live in Arkansas, Bentonville, Arkansas. Anybody know anything about Bentonville, Arkansas? Walmart headquarters, you're right. And so because Walmart there, trillion dollar company is there, you have literally people from all over nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and they're there. So God moved us there. And so we moved there, and we told our children, you are missionaries, you are ambassadors wherever you go. So they went out into the community, started making friends, and one day a parent came up to me and said, hey, are you Salem Anthony's mom, dad? Not mom. I said, yes. And she said, do you study the Bible with your children? I said, yes. She said, will you study the Bible with my children? I said, yes. yes. And so over a year and a half ago, my children started a Bible study every Monday night uh, with their friends. And guess what? Over time, now when we started, the kids were kind of like, you know, ADD, swimming around the chairs. But over time, we've seen that God has been working on their hearts. And so then it turns out that what the two children, their grandmother was going to move, and so she decided to take everybody to Top Golf. So we we're going to go to Top Golf, and so we go there. And I had never met her grandmother. I'd seen her, and she was uh, telling me how much she loved the Lord, and she was excited to move back to Alabama. That was on a Thursday. That Monday, she got diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer changed her whole life, changed the family's life. And so then, as a result of that, the, 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 the parents of the two children, they were having uh, some issues, and so I started having Bible studies with the husband. And he literally had never read the Bible before. Have you ever read the Bible with someone who's never read the Bible before? And everything that they read is just, wow, that's amazing! And you're like, Man, I don't have that reaction anymore. <laughs> and so as we studied the Bible, God began to work on his heart. And long story short, God opened up this family. And so we went on a missionary journey to Florida for a whole month. And during that month, all hell broke loose in that home. And we came back and the mother and daughter were not even talking to each other anymore. And so I asked them, because I was giving Bible studies with both sides, I said, are you willing to sit down with me and to understand what biblical forgiveness is and biblical reconciliation? And they said, yes. And so what I'm going to share with you is what I shared with them one Sunday morning. And so let's take our Bible. So we're answering the question, what the Bible says about forgiveness. Let's go to our Bibles, Matthew chapter 6. Where are we going? Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 9. This is very, very familiar with you, but we're going to put it in the context that Jesus uh, 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 presented it. Matthew chapter uh, 6, chapter 6, verse 9. It says, 
In this manner, therefore, pray. And what's the first thing he says? Our Father. What does it say? Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy is your name. So first thing we need to understand, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to connect with God as their Father. Father. And he says, holy is his name. Is our God holy? Amen? Amen. Is he reverent? He says, your kingdom come, your will be done where? In earth as it is in heaven. So what this teaches us is God wants earth to be an extension of everything that goes on in heaven. So your home should be a, a little uh, outpost of heaven. That means if people come in contact with you, they are coming in contact with the kingdom of heaven. He says, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And he says, give us this day our what? Daily bread. And then he's, he's waxing eloquent about God and how he's the father. He's holy. He's everything. And then he says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That doesn't seem to, to fit right there. It seems like Jesus is trying to communicate something about the Father, about his kingdom, and he says, unless you forgive others, you cannot be forgiven. He goes on to say, so what does it mean to forgive then? You know, some people say, well, I said I'm sorry. Has anybody ever had somebody say they're sorry and they keep doing the same thing over and over and over again? Is that true sorrow for sin. How does, that, how does that affect your relationship, wives? If your husband keeps doing the same thing over and over and over again, does it strengthen or does it weaken? Husbands, if, 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 if your wife says, I'm sorry, so it weakens the relationship. So I looked up that, that, the, the word forgive, and I wanted to know what does it mean? It means to what? To dismiss it, right? It also means to don't hold on to it. So the idea is, imagine carrying a little stone around in your hand, and every day you carry that stone around, it gets what? Heavier and heavier and heavier, and it begins to annoy you. It begins to wear you down. And so God says, don't hold on to those things that other people have done to you. Don't hold on to the, the, the pain and the, 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 the hurt. He said, don't hold on to it because ultimately it's going to annoy you. So we see it means to dismiss it. It means not to hold on to it. But really it means just to let it go. Let's say it together. What does forgiveness mean? To let it go, right? So the, the more you carry this thing around, the heavier it gets, and it begins to hinder your relationship. It begins to hinder, hinder your life, not the other. So I'm going through this beautiful Bible study with the mother and the, 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 the daughter and the son-in-law. And I'm showing them from the Bible, this is biblical forgiveness. Amen. And they're like, okay, okay. And I'm thinking like, yes, I can see the Holy Spirit working on their hearts. Lord, you're going to bring forgiveness and reconciliation today. And I'm telling them, just let it go. Don't carry it around with you any longer. You see, it will hinder you. You see, forgiveness is not for the other person. Forgiveness is for you. Let's say it together. Forgiveness is not for them. Forgiveness is for who? Me. And so how many of you guys remember this story? Remember the, the two brothers. And, 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 and so Jacob deceives Esau. Is that what he did? No, he didn't deceive him. Actually, Esau was coming and Esau wanted the food. And he says, I'm about to die. And what did Jacob want? He wanted the birthright. And so he was like, ah, this is my opportunity. And so he tried to haggle and tried to get the birthright. And guess what? In the process, he made a friend or an enemy. 
He made an enemy of his brother. And so, notice that this thing, how did it affect him? Did he get to see his mother? Did he get to see his father? Did, he literally had to go away for 21 years. 21 years separated, 21 years carrying this thing around, 21 years of being burdened with his sin. Somebody's been carrying around sin way too long. Some of y'all been carrying grudges between your mama and your brother and your cousin, your uncles, your aunt. They did this, I'm not going to forgive. And you're like Jacob. And you are, are carrying this thing around year after year, day after day, and they are living their life free. You see, when we hold on to unforgiveness, it stops our progress. Mentally, physically, spiritually, socially, emotionally. So what happened? <laughs> 21 years later, he sends everybody away, and, and Jacob is there, and he's struggling. He's like, oh, Esau's coming with 300 men, and he's going to get revenge on me. And he thinks it's his brother, and what does he begin to do? He's wrestling. He thought he was literally fighting for his life, but who was he fighting against? He was fighting against God. Is it possible you think you're fighting against them, but you're really fighting against God? You thought it was them, but God says, no, it's you. <laughs> you're the problem. I'm the solution. Will you let me? And he says, I will not let you go. I will not let you go unless you bless me. And God's like, well, I can't bless you until you let it go. I gave you, I forgave you 21 years ago. You've been carrying around this burden. You've been carrying around this bitterness. You been, and so I said, I said, will you let it go? And they were like, yes, we're going to let it go. Verse 13 says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from what? You see, the temptation is not to forgive. What's the temptation? Not to forgive. To keep holding on to it. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory for what? Forever and ever and ever. Amen. Is that where it stops? Notice the next verse. Verse 14, he says it again. It says, and oh yeah, by the way, if you forgot that whole forgive us as we forget our debts, right? He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father might forgive you. Wait, you're not, your Bible doesn't say that? It says, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, neither will your Father in heaven, what? <laughs> Does God take forgiveness seriously? And he's reiterating it. He's saying, hey, by the way, yes, I'm holy. Yes, I'm righteous. Yes, I will, I will not lead you in temptation. Yes, I'll deliver you from evil. But guess what? I'm serious about forgiveness. So why, preacher? Why, why should I forgive them? They didn't even ask for forgiveness. Colossians 3.13 says, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as... Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> why should I forgive them? Because Christ forgave me. Can I get an Amen. Now, when our dear principal remembers me, it most likely was not a positive memory. You can laugh because it's true. But guess what? God knew that I would stand here today. Man looks at what? The outward appearance, but God knows what? And I had issues. 
There were people that had done things to me when I met him that I was carrying around and it took me 20, 30 years later to finally figure it out. But if the Son sets you free, what? You shall be free indeed. You see, as Christ hath forgiven you, how many in here has not been forgiven by Christ? Oh, so that means all of us. All of us are standing under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. Amen? Amen? All of us are children of grace. Amen? Amen? So guess what? All of us are commanded by our Father to forgive. You see, forgiveness is not always mutual. Notice Luke 23, 34, it says, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Wait, wait. Forgive them. Why? Because they don't even know what they're doing. You see, forgiveness is an attribute of divinity. Forgiveness is not something we do. It's something God gives us as a gift. And so there, he says, whom who has forgiven much will what? Love much. And so notice in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, it says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For what? Love will... What does love do? It covers some sins. I mean, not those sins that, you know, those really bad sins. It's only the, 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 the good sins. Is there even such thing? No, love covers a multitude of sins. That's your sins and their sins. So forgiveness is personal. So at this point, I stopped and I said, Miss so-and-so, are you willing to forgive your daughter for all that she has done? I said, daughter. Are you willing to forgive your mother for all that she has done? Are you willing to let it go? And they said yes. And they said, I would like to address some issues, some unresolved issues. And if I had had wisdom, I would have said, let's just let that go. But I allowed them to, to vocalize and share the, the things that, that were hurting them, that they had been carrying around for years. And guess what that did? Man, it went south so fast. <laughs> and I was like, Lord, what is going on? Like, this is, no, this is not the way I had intended it. There's supposed to be reconciliation. So, so what is reconciliation? See, forgiveness is for the other person. Reconciliation is when two parties who have either hurt each other or been hurt by each other are willing to come together. Let's, let's keep going. What, is, what the Bible says about reconciliation? So reconciliation means to restore a what? Anybody in here have broken relationships? Anyone? Broken relationship, broken friendships, right? And so the, 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 this, the, I want you to imagine barriers, right? So I imagine like a, a, an old bag of old trash, and that trash is outside your heart. And so over time, flies and maggots and just nastiness and all this. And so this just begins to putrefy at the door of your heart. <laughs> and so this is all the hurt, the guilt, the shame, the anger, the, the pain, the sadness, and it metastasizes and becomes bitterness. And oftentimes it becomes depression. Do we see a rise in depression in the world today? Do we see a, a, a rise in anxiety? Disorders? Do you know that planet Earth has a mental health crisis? And guess what? The root of it is rooted and grounded in unforgiveness and unreconciliation. Relationships have been broken. So 
to bring back, to reconcile, into favor. This is only possible if both parties are willing to work at it, what? Together. So let's go to 2 Corinthians. Where are we going? 2 Corinthians. Are you still with me? Amen, Pastor. Are you still with me? All right. We're in 2 Corinthians, and we're starting with verse chapter 5, and we're going to uh, start with verse 17. Notice what it says. It says, therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have become passed away. Behold, some things have become new. Amen? Wait, it doesn't say some? You mean all things have to become new when I accept Jesus? You mean even that old stuff I've been carrying around? So notice this video. What do you see? Well, I hope it, right? Hold on, it's supposed to play. Oh, it's playing? Okay, what do you see? A metamorphosis. Okay, so I have a question. How many of you think that a caterpillar and a butterfly are the exact same creature? Raise your hand if you think they're the same. How many, how many of you think that they're, they're totally 100% different? How many of you have no clue? <laughs> so, so when the caterpillar wraps itself up in the cocoon, what's happening? It's wrapping itself. And you know what happens to itself? It literally liquefies and totally dissolves in the cocoon, and then out of this soupy DNA whatever, it becomes a little bit different. It becomes what? 100% different. When you see a caterpillar, you're like, oh. When you see a, a butterfly, you're like, oh. <laughs> right? So this is the transformation. Our brother here said the Greek word is metamorpho. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. It's a change from within that is visible without. Come on now. <laughs> it's a change from within that is visible without. You see, I was born to, 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 to God-fearing Seventh-day Adventist parents and they got divorced when I was three or four years old, and they sent me away, and they uh, got a divorce, and that caused trauma, and while I was living with a, 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 um, a family member, uh, I got introduced to pornography, I got produced, introduced to violence, and my mom said when I came back to California that I was a totally different person. I had been changed. And so I was angry, and I was bitter, and I began to listen to hip-hop music. Y'all don't know what that is, but anyway, I used to listen to this music, and it was something called gangster rap, and they were cursing, and they were angry, and guess what? It fueled the fire of anger and bitterness, young people. <laughs> and my parents couldn't understand, my teachers couldn't understand, but guess what? Snoop could understand. <laughs> Y'all don't know who that is, but anyway, and so, so, but guess what? I needed a transformation. I needed to forgive. I was my first church that I pastored uh, in the Northwest, and I remember my, 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 my devotion. God woke me up and said, I want you to tell the young people what your grandfather did to you. This is 20, 30 years, right? I was like, oh, man. I have forgiven him, right? I went to, I went, I lived with him since then, and I remember I got up to speak. This is, I'd been at the church for about three weeks, and I get up to speak, and it's like all the memories, all the pain, it just, the dam broke, and I'm standing there just weeping, and all the people are like, this is the new pastor, <laughs> right? And, and they're like, oh, what do we do? And I'm sitting there, and I'm, and I'm trying to speak about forgiveness. My grandfather had just passed away. 
and I'm trying to, to, to illustrate to them how powerful it is. And after I got myself together, I stood up, I gave the presentation, two young ladies came to me, and they said, Pastor, you just gave me the greatest gift Amen. I could ever receive. I'm going to go call my parent, grandparent, cousin, whoever. I'm going to call them, and I'm going to forgive them. See, forgiveness is the most powerful thing in the universe. Most people will not listen to the first, second, third angel's message. They won't listen to the uh, 2,300 days. They won't listen to what you have to say about the Sabbath and the state of the dead because they see bitterness in your life. They see anger in your life. They, they see unforgiveness in your life, and they say, if it doesn't work for you, guess what? Why would I? <laughs> you see, we're, we're, we want to give the gospel, right? Amen? Amen? We have the everlasting gospel, true or false? Our gospel is supposed to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, as a, what? And people as a witness. <laughs> As a witness, people are waiting for you to witness. Have you been changed? That's the question. Have you been changed? It says, now all things are of God who has what? Reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the what? So you know that when you receive Jesus, you become a minister. Amen? Amen? Did you know that it's not just the pastor? It's not just the elders and the deacons. You have a ministry. Amen. What's your ministry? The ministry of what? Reconcil Does the world need to be reconciled to God? <laughs> Notice it says, for that is that now notice this God was in Christ what reconciling the world to himself and notice not Amen. oh did you get it Amen. what what does it mean to forgive to not hold on to it <laughs> he says not holding their sins against them can I get a hallelujah thank you Jesus <laughs> that God does not hold your sins against you. That's good news for somebody. That's good news for somebody because you thought that he can't forgive someone like me. He can't, you know, I've done X, Y, and that's what Jacob was wrestling with. He's like, I've lied, I've cheated, I've stolen. I've raped and murdered. I, I'm wicked. And God says, yes, I came to save you. Amen. This is the everlasting gospel. Amen. It says, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. <laughs> so we are what? What's an ambassador? Anybody from another country in here? Name your country. Anybody from Mexico, Honduras, Kenya, Guatemala, hola, como estas? No? <laughs> now, if I'm an ambassador, right? If I'm an ambassador, I am a representative of that country. I am a citizen. And guess what? The way I live my life is representative of that heavenly world. Amen. So when people come in contact with you and me, they should say, wow. It says, since God is what? Making his appeal through, did you know that God is making his appeal to your neighbors, to your co-workers, to your non-Adventist, non-Christian, non-believing family members? Do you know that God is making his appeal to your children and grandchildren? How's that going? He says, we beg you on behalf of Christ, what? 
be reconciled to God. You see, before we can be reconciled to others, we must first be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. You see, we'll end with this. We're ending. Amen, Pastor. Oh, we're ending, amen. <laughs> so I want to end with this illustration. You all know the, 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 the prodigal son, right? And so notice, uh, we're going to read Matthew 5, and then we'll get to the prodigal son, and we'll finish. It says, so when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something, what? Against you. He says what? Leave your gift there before the altar and go first be what? Wait, so I can't even, God will not accept my worship, my sacrifice, if I have aught with my brother or my sister. Does that explain our church condition? <laughs> there are people in this room. There are people watching live. There are people in churches all over the world that have not been reconciled to each other. They're on the board, right? They're on the deacon, they're elders, and everybody knows, oh, don't get them two together. We can't invite them. Am, am I lying? I'm just making this up. No, this is, and so God is saying, hey, even the act of worship, if you're coming Sabbath by Sabbath, holding on, guess what? He says, go get right with your brother first, and then come get right with me. So speaking of brothers, we know the story of the prodigal son, right? The younger brother came and said, give me my inheritance. The older brother was just like, oh, I wouldn't do it. And so the younger brother, he leaves. And guess what? He's gone. And what does he do with the substance? He wasted with riotous, drunken, debauched. He was a heathen. <laughs> and he goes, and the father was waiting for him the whole time. He sees this younger son of his, and the Bible says he ran and he fell on him. Now, my question is, why did the father run to the prodigal son and fall on him at, when he did? You can answer. Go ahead. Because he loved him. Okay. Anyone else? He missed him. He, he, had, he had forgiven him. He was waiting for him. He was praying for him. To, uh, uh, say that again, my brother. To protect him. Now, this young man is 100% right. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 21. You see, even though we are forgiven, are there not still consequences? And notice what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. And notice what the Bible said. If there was a, a rebellious and stubborn son, it says starting with 21, starting with verse 18, he says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of the, his father and the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out to the elders in his city and unto the gate of his place, verse 20, and they shall say unto the elders in his city, this our son is what? Stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Was the prodigal, did he fit this condition? Now notice, it says, verse 21, and all the men of his city shall stone him with stones, and he will die. Yep. Woo! So when the prodigal comes home, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. He had a death penalty, what? Looming, judgment was coming. And the father, in love, even though he forgave him years ago, he came and he fell on him. And he cleaned him up and he threw a powerful party to save his life. 
Is that not a beautiful picture of the plan of salvation, what Jesus has done for you? But the older brother. The older brother. How did the older brother respond? It says, now the older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. He's like, what's going on? The older brother. And it says, so he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said, your brother who was lost, he's come back. And the older brother was like, praise God. Was there bitterness there? Was there anger there? He was so angry, he was like, I'm not even going into the party. See, he really wanted to do what the younger son did. He just didn't have the, the guts, right? And so it says, and he said unto him, your brother has come, and because he was received with him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf, then the father comes out to the older brother, and he says, but he was angry and would not go in. And the father came out, and he says, son, all that I have is yours. Amen. Jesus says, all power in heaven and earth is delivered unto me. Therefore, what? Go. But that's not my gift, preacher. I don't like knocking on doors. I don't like sharing my, did God say it was optional? Is it optional? No. no. It's a command. Now, we're big on the commandments of God, aren't we? Amen? Amen. And rightfully so, but his last commandment is go. Teach. Preach. Live. Forgive. The older brother was holding on. There were barriers. Sometimes we're like the older brother. The younger brothers and sisters, they come in and they're not dressed right. They don't eat right. They don't talk right. They don't look right. They don't act right. And we get all high and mighty. And we chase them away. God is waiting for a generation of young and old, rich and poor, black and white, and everything in between that will put self aside. You see, the father said, son, you are always with me, and all that I have Amen. is yours. Amen. Isn't that good news? Amen. All that God has is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You see, my brother's going to come and sing an appeal song. That day, I wept bitterly because neither the mother nor the daughter would forgive. Neither of them would let go. And it literally tore them apart to this day. But there's good news. So a week later, my neighbor called me, and I preached this sermon the following Sabbath at my local church, and my wife was like, what if she hears this sermon? And I was like, there's no way she'll ever hear this sermon. And she says, but what if she hears it? And I was like, whatever. I get a text the following Sabbath, I just watched your sermon twice. So I made a beeline to her house. I didn't know what to expect. And she's there in tears. And she said, London, I let it go. Amen. She said, it's like the world has been taken off of my shoulders. She was bedridden. She was in a bad, bad way. Within two or three days, she was up. She was smiling. She was cooking for herself. She took herself off of hospice. She took herself off of all this stuff. And she said, London, I just needed to let it go. I said, will you come to my Seventh-day Adventist church and give your testimony? 
She was like, I'm Pentecostal. Have you been slain in the spirit? I said, I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. I said, you see it a little bit different, but will you come anyway? She was like, yes. She came and she shared. And there was not a dry eye. And people were like, wow, that is powerful. Is there anyone here that needs to let it go? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And today you recognize, Father, I've been carrying this thing around for far too long. Lord, I want to let it go. I've tried before, (laughs) but it keeps coming back. Lord, I want to let it go. Lord, I need to be reconciled to you first. Lord, I I have family members and friends and co-workers. Lord, you know I want to be a minister of reconciliation, but I must be reconciled first. If this is you, God knows your heart. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to come forward. Just speak in your heart, Lord, reconcile me today. Father in heaven, Lord, we acknowledge our greatest need is the greatest power in this universe, and that is your love. Lord, you have forgiven us. You said, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lord, we can't do it without you, Lord. Forgiveness is a divine act. And so, Lord, give us the gift of forgiveness. Lord, help us to forgive ourselves. And, Lord, when it's all said and done, Lord, we want to be your ministers to take this gospel of the kingdom to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people beginning with our own families, our own communities, our own schools and churches, Father. Lord, may we glorify you in Jesus' holy, precious, and powerful name. Let everyone say, amen. Amen. Amen.